Hey everyone, and welcome to another episode of CNC Base Camp. Got a fun project today that I think you're going to enjoy. To build it, we're getting out the old X-Carve Pro. It's a mighty machine, and I'm really glad we have it, and it's gonna be fun to use. Here's our project. It is a bench. It's kind of a small bench. We've been struggling with what to name it. Bench and a half, gossip bench. I kind of think maybe the, uh, the contemplative bench, because it's a place where you'd sit and still have room for your coffee, a book, have a phone conversation, have a little extra room beside you. Now I'm making an indoor version out of ash, but if you'd like to substitute an outdoor wood like white oak, it would be a fantastic garden bench. So let's go ahead and get started. This episode is sponsored by Inventables. Design it, build it, sell it. Learn more at inventables.com. All right, well, it's time for us to start cutting parts. Now, if you look at the computer screen over here, you'll see the shape of the leg. Now, I designed these parts in Autodesk Inventor, created DXF files, and then brought those into vCarve. vCarve is a nice program, and I'm familiar with it, so I wanted to stick with using it. One of the great things about the easel system is that I can import a VCAR file directly into it. And so that's what I've done. My machine is set up with a one quarter inch upcut bit for efficient cutting in this ash. I've got my parts secured, everything is zeroed out. I think we're ready to start. Now there are three different cuts that we need to make to complete the seat. Cut number one is going to be to make the mortises that the back slats fit into. So that's on the top of the seat. When we're done with that, the seat gets flipped over and we'll create mortises for the legs and then cut the final profile. Now you might notice I've got our seat blank propped up at an angle. Well that's because the back is set at four degrees. And so to create a four degree mortise I've simply gone to my Autodesk Inventor program, made a little sketch, and it told me that I needed about one and three eighths inches propped at this back edge to create four degrees off the face. And so this is a super simple way for us to use a conventional CNC router and create some angled joinery. I've got everything set up with a quarter inch upcut bit, great bit for cutting mortises. I have created an XY datum point here at the center of my blank. However, I zeroed off of what would be the back edge of the mortise for those back slats. So this is one of those times where we got to think our way through a little bit. Well, we've completed the legs and we've completed the seat. Now it's time to produce all the uprights, which go into the mortises that we cut on the seat and which will hold the crest rail. Now, one thing about these parts, there's a lap joint where the crest rail will sit. All the parts in this project will receive an eighth inch round over. So to ensure a nice tight fit in this lap joint, what I need is not a 90 degree angled cut here at the intersection of these two faces, but rather a fillet. So rather than using a quarter inch straight bit, I'm using a quarter inch ball nose bit. On this part here, I've got the machine set up to cut pockets on two parts for this area. Once that's done, I'm going to change out the bits to the quarter inch straight, and then the machine will cut the outside profile. Well, there we go, that's the crest rail. And that's the last of our parts for our bench. So what's left? Well, what I need to do now is to remove the parts from their parent stock and clean up all the tabs. Then I'm gonna take a router with a 1 8 inch radius bit and I'm gonna round over all the edges to soften things up. After that, a good sanding, and then we'll be ready to start assembling. 
All the parts have been cut. I've routed the edges, given everything a bit of a sanding. We are ready to start assembling our bench. So the glue that I'm going to use is hide glue, just to give myself a little bit more time. You go ahead and use whatever glue you're comfortable with. So we'll start with the legs. And I'll begin by putting a little bit of glue in these mortises. And I'm going to put a little bit of glue on the tenons also to make sure everything is coated with glue. And you'll notice, of course, that I have routed the edges of these tenons, and that's part of getting them to fit in our mortises. One thing I like about CNC joiner is things usually fit pretty well. All right, so there are legs in place. Let me flip this over. And I'm going to go ahead and march on to putting the uprights into the bench. So same routine. I'm going to put some glue down in each mortise, put some glue on the end of each upright on the tenon. We'll fit them in. Of course, I'm using hide glue here, which I, I enjoy because of the long open time. It keeps me from having to rush so much. One glue we're using a lot in the shop these days is epoxy. And everybody seems to really enjoy it because it, of course, it's good both in for indoor work and for outdoor work. But it has has a lubricating quality to it. So when you're sliding your joints together, they're not quite as grabby as with conventional yellow glue. And frankly, who needs the stress of a panicked glue up, right? So if you're doing an outdoor bench, epoxy would sure be a great choice. All right, well, that's the last upright in place. I'm going to set the bench on the floor now because it will be a little more convenient for me to work on. And our next step and last step is going to be to go ahead and put the crest rail in. The crest rail sits in these laps. It'll be glued. And then I've drilled a hole through each of these for a one inch screw to reinforce things. Once the screw is in place, I've got some plugs cut. We'll plug the holes and pretty much have the bench in hand. Now to make things a little easier, I did dry fit the bench beforehand and I pre-drilled for screws in the back of the crest rail. All right, so there we go. I think we're, what we need to do now is just wait for the glue to dry. So, what about some alternatives? I had a couple good suggestions given to me this morning. One, how about routing out the seat and dishing it slightly? That would be an awesome thing to do with your CNC router. Another is think of the things that you could add up on the crest rail. Carvings, lettering, personalize it in any way you like. So there's a lot of potential to a bench. Another thing to think about is finishing. Now this is ash. My plan is to give it a coat of oil to bring out a little color and then to shoot it with about three coats of nitrocellulose lacquer here at the shop. But ash is very, very versatile. One thing you might consider doing is liming it with a white stain. Or you could go the other direction and go almost black. And the reason why that looks great with ash is because it has a very prominent and deep grain, which will always show through. Another fun thing to try is you can finish ash clear or with a colored coating and then use a glaze that you work into the pores of the wood and then wipe off. And it can really create some stunning effects. 
An easy thing to do is to use clear coat on the ash and then use a white glaze. But you can make colors too using tempera paints and plaster. Add a little water, work that into the pores, sponge it off, sand off the haze on everything when it's dry, and then shoot it again with some lacquer or clear coating, a non-yellowing coating. So a lot of things to experiment with, a lot of things to think about. Now this has been a, a fun project. I hope you'll, you've enjoyed it. The DXF files will be available on our website along with a complete set of instructions. If you do build this bench, please send me a picture. We'd love to show it to everyone and would enjoy hearing from you. Well, we just finished up our bench and it was built using a four by four foot format machine, which is great if you got it. Most of us probably have more of a desktop machine, but don't let that limit you. If you use the feature of tiling, you can create large furniture projects and all sorts of things with a relatively small machine. So what we're going to do is do a little test piece in which we'll cut the crest rail of our bench on a two by two foot format machine. And the crest rail measures about 48 inches in length total. The first thing we need to do to cut our crest rail is to go to the computer and get some files made for tiling. Well, to set up the tiling files, I'm in the program that I use, which is vCarve. What I have here is my material, and I've set it up vertically in the screen here, because one of the things you have to do is make sure you're oriented correctly to how you can pass material through your router. So I know with our next wave shark that I need to orient the board vertically in my screen here. I've brought in a DXF file of the crest rail of the bench and I've centered it on my material. I've also created a cutting file using a quarter inch bit, cutting a little bit deeper than our thickness of the birch plywood that I'm using as a sample piece. I've added some tabs, just like any other profile cut you'd make. Where things change is when we go to the end of our sequence, and this little widget here is for tiling toolpaths, and you see it brings up a different window, the Toolpath Tiling Manager. What I need to do is first select that I am in fact tiling, and you can see it gives me a couple selections. One is the tile height and the tile overlap. And that's going to depend on the size of your machine and the size of the part that you're making. I'm choosing to make this part in three pieces, and each of them will be 18 inches long. Now, one of the things we have to remember when using tiling is that where each tile butts into another tile, we need to have things overlap slightly so that the router bit can pass into the next tile. If we don't do that, what's going to happen is we're going to end up with small, round, little pieces of material where the router bit can't quite cut that last bit. So that is one of our options, and I have set the tile overlap at half of an inch. So with all that done, you can see that the tile manager has set up three tiles on the screen. The, each tile is indicated and named, so T1, T2, and T3. You'll also see a band of yellow separating them, and that band of yellow represents the amount of overlap. You can see that if I were to choose a huge overlap, let's say we go two inches, update, that band becomes quite a bit wider. So let me go back to what we had, which was 0.5 and we'll update. Once that's done, I can go ahead and hide the tile manager and then it's a simple matter of saving just as you would normally. So I have my post processor for next wave CNC and I'll simply hit save. You can name your file and now we'll save. The interesting thing is when we go to where that file was saved, in this case onto my desktop, what we're going to find is that the program created three independent files, one for each of the tiling sections. So here is tile one, CNC Basecamp tiling demo. A little bit below, we have tile two. And here we have tile three. So even though we've only saved once, 
the tile manager creates three independent files. And so when we get back to our router, we're going to run three separate files in order to create the tiling pattern and create the crest rail in our machine. Well, I've got everything set up for cutting our demo crest rail. So I have a piece of plywood in here that's about 50 plus inches long by 11 inches wide. And I have it set up for our first pass. I'm gonna choose the T1 tile file and turn on our spindle. Well, as you can see, we've completed our cut. We've completed the file for T1. The next step we need to do is to advance our workpiece into the area for tile two. And it's always a challenge of how you register your part and advance at an exact distance. Now, everyone's got a different solution. Mine is pretty simple. What I do is I install a fence for the part to slide against. And my fence is exactly 18 inches long, or the length of the tile segment that I'm going to be using. So in order to advance this exactly 18 inches, all I do is make a little tick mark with a pencil on the back of my fence. I slide my workpiece forward and I line up that pencil line with the front of the fence. Simple, it's direct. And now we're ready to run T2. Well, there we go. There's our crest rail in three pieces tiled on this small machine. So as you can see, it's an easy process and it really allows you a lot of flexibility and growth with your machine. Now, what we've done here is create a long piece, but also you might want to think about wide pieces. Let's say you need a four by four foot logo of a sports team. Well, okay, you can't do four by four feet, but what you can do is two two by four foot segments. And then when you're done, use something conventional like biscuits or splines to join the two halves together. So, tiling is a fantastic way of making your little machine do big things. I think one of the more baffling parts of learning to use a CNC router is learning what combination of feed rate and speed of your router or spindle is right for the bit you're using and the material that you're using. What we want is a situation that gives you great results and where the bit stays cool and the edges don't burn and degrade. And that's a real problem. You know, we've all had experiences using handheld routers where we've burned, let's say, cherry when routing an edge on it. And we can get away with that in small runs. But when you're using a CNC machine, which potentially could run for hours, it's very, very important that we run the bit at the optimum speed and the optimum feed so that it stays cool. If the bit overheats, the edge breaks down, it gets dull. We've essentially murdered a $30 router bit. And I have bought enough $30 router bits over the years that I want to make sure the ones I have stay in great shape for as long as I can. So how do we find that optimum combination of feed and speed? Well, to do that, one of the things we need to consider is the chip load. 
So what's a chip load? Well, there's a mathematical formula to describe it, and that is that a chip load equals the feed rate divided by the RPM times the number of flutes of your bit. Now, typically, we're going to be using, as woodworkers, a two-flute bit. Three-flute bits are sometimes used in woodworking. I've used them quite a bit for mortising. They don't grab as badly as a two flute, but I found that on CNC machines, they don't clear the chips very well. Single flute bits are typically used for soft plastics and aluminum. So we're gonna concentrate on a two flute bit. Two flute bits clear the chips well and the geometry is such that they're pretty stable. They're not gonna deflect much. We don't have a too much chance of breakage if we handle them correctly. In order to get started, it's nice to have some ranges of different speeds to begin with. You know, for a straight bit in hardwood, I find that about 50 inches per minute up to about 110 inches per minute is a pretty good bracket. And these brackets for different materials, such as hardwood, such as softwood, such as plywood, you're going to find them mostly through experience. Now there are some good books and there are some good online sources and you should find those because those will help you out in getting a good starting point. But experience is the ultimate teacher. Now, what I have open here is Vectric V-Carve and on the screen is a crest rail for the bench that we were just building. I'm gonna go ahead and hit the edit function for the tooling and you'll see on here an in mill that's a quarter of an inch and here we're going to find feeds and speeds. I have the RPM set at 16,000 RPM and a feed rate of 75 inches per minute. This software automatically does the math for me and gives me a chip load of 0.0023. So what we want is the largest chip load. So if you don't have a little chart of formulas, that's okay. What you can do is play with the numbers a little bit. Let's say I speed this up to 17,000 RPM. You can see our chip load just decreased a little bit. Let's say I take the feed rate up to 120 inches per minute. Now that was a pretty substantial change. So we want the largest number that we can get. Now, I happen to know from experience with uh, our machine that we're using today that a spindle speed of about 1650 works very well. I know that the feed rate in ash is probably a little high at 120 inches per minute. I'm going to back it down to 95, and that gives me a chip load of 0 0.0029. So, don't worry so much about the numbers as much as you're looking to make the largest chip load number that you can. So what we're after, of course, is the largest chip load number that we can bracket in. Now, what does a large chip load number really mean? It does, of course, mean a large chip, but the important thing is that a large chip efficiently carries heat away from the bit, and that's what we're after. So you can use the formula, you can find some tables, Use what's available in the software and look for the largest chip load number. Ultimately, experience is going to be the guide. Let's go over to our CNC machine and let's do a couple sample cuts. The first one, I'm going to cut very slowly at a fairly high RPM. The second one, I'm going to cut at a little lower RPM and pretty fast. And hopefully what we're going to see is a difference between the two, between a cut that produces dust and probably is going to run hot and a cut that produces chips and is going to cut cool. All right, we've just seen our two sample cuts. Cut number one, the router was going very slow, the RPM was high, it produced a lot of fine dust. That's not good because that means we're getting heat build up on the router bit and that will shorten the life of the router bit. Cut number two, we were running with a high feed rate, a low RPM, and as you can see, we got these nice coarse chips and that is what we want because that means the bit is running cool. One thing to keep in mind as you're balancing feed rate and RPM is the lateral pressure against the bit. If we push the bit really hard, we may risk bit breakage. 
One of the ways we can control lateral pressure is by working with the depth of cut. A good rule to follow is that the depth of cut should be no more than one half the diameter of the router bit. So this is a one quarter inch router bit in the machine right now. I probably don't want to cut any deeper than one eighth of an inch with it. That's a good safe range. So if you're working with hardwood, cut less. If you're working with softwood, maybe you can cut a little deeper, but use the depth of cut to control the amount of lateral force on your router bit. And the depth of cut really has nothing to do with the chip load at all. So to wrap things up, look for that ideal balance between your feed rate, your RPM that produces the largest chip load number that you can. And don't get hung up when you see charts in books and magazines about ideal chip rates. They're really tough to meet with a small hobby machine like this. Just go for the largest number you can and that will give you the best quality finish and it will keep your router bits running much longer. This episode is sponsored by Inventables. Design it, build it, sell it. Learn more at inventables.com.